Our second scripture lesson this morning comes from the little epistle of Ephesians. And it is identified as one of Paul's letters. Um, most scholarship agrees that it is not, although there's dispute about that. But, you know, that shouldn't bother us because it was common in the ancient world to ascribe later writings to someone who was revered as Paul was. It is very likely that this was written by a disciple of Paul to a second or third generation of Christians. Um, and one of the reasons we say that is because the language is slightly different. It's a much more elevated kind of thought. And what, the, what this disciple of Paul is, is trying to do is, is right in a cosmic way um, uh, his or her understanding of what God was doing in Christ. And that's what the book of Ephesians in some ways is about. Probably written to the letter of Ephesus, but probably to the churches all around the ancient city of Ephesus, uh, which you can go to today. Ephesians 1 and I will be reading from verse 3 through 14. I invite you to follow along in your pew Bible or simply listen for the word of God as I read these words. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of his glorious gr grace that he freely bestowed on all of, his, all of the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of his grace that he has lavished upon us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, all things in heaven and things upon the earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with a holy seal of the promised spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards the redemption of God's own people to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. The truth be known, for the last several years, New Year's Day has been a mixed blessing. And I confess it is so because every New Year's Day I get up and I get the post on the doorstep and I open up the style section and they always do a list of who or what is in or who or what is out. Do any of you get that list? You know what I'm talking about. I don't know when they started that list. It's an insidious thing, you know that they do this. It's a test of pop culture. And if you're really with it, you understand what's going on there. And if you really are not, then you have not a clue. And it is true for me. I mean, cultural wisdom is something that ministers are supposed to keep up with. You know what I mean? Did any of you look at this list? Yeah, I, did, were you depressed? Uh, thank you, thank you, I, very. I mean, I didn't even know what was out let alone what was in. Now there was one thing that was in that I was glad about. It's Orange is the New Black. It's a TV show, uh, interesting TV show, a memoir about um, uh, women in prison, part serious, part comedy. But the truth is I only watch it because my wife loves it. So does that make me in or out? Ah, I'm out. I mean, I think it's okay, but I mean, I'm really out. Um, and then uh, later that day, I, as I always do on New Year's Day, because, you know, not because of resolutions, because they have a special spinning class at Results Gym, and my wife has a membership, and I get to go in free on New Year's Day, and it's an hour and a half spinning. Do you know what spinning is? 
Yeah, it's good for my knees. I, I'm getting older. My knees need it. And they always do music, just spinning. They use, you, you spin to the beat. You know, that's part of it. And, and they were only going to do uh, 2013 music, right? So I thought, now this is going to be another test, right? Do, I, I recognize any of this. And the surprising thing was that I did recognize it. It's because I've been spinning a lot. And it seems like every spinning instructor does 2013 music. The sad news is, is I'm sick of it. Which only, which only goes to enhance the general malaise that I'm feeling. Maybe uh, a lot of people my age at 62 are increasingly feeling about being out of it. Something the cat drug in. You know what I mean? Just being kind of not with it. Uh, the truth is, I've never been that trendy. I've never, even when I was a teenager, I wasn't. Somebody had to tell me what was in. I had to watch it. Somebody had to say, bell bottoms were in. Do this. And, uh, you know, and then whenever I caught up with it, it was too late. It was out. <laughs> One thing I did do that was really good on New Year's Day. Um, some of you had been telling me about Brene Brown, a wonderful writer, a researcher, a Ph.D., a uh, social worker who teaches at the University of Houston had, has, has uh, written some wonderfully accessible work on her research on shame and vulnerability. Many of you have commented that you think there's some similarities between shame and vulner vulnerability, what I have been talking about as the cross or cruciformity or crucifixion and resurrection, God bringing life out of the death-tending ways of the world. And so I read the book, and I, I, I think you're right. There are real similarities here. For you see, for several years now, um, I think largely due to my wife, who is a feminist biblical scholar, but also I'm intrigued by feminist um, philosophy, feminist theology, and especially feminists who are redoing and critiquing traditional male understandings of sin traditional male understandings of sin as pride and arrogance. That comes from Augustine, by the way, 1,500 years ago. Augustine defines sin as the sin of Adam in disobedience, and it is pride, according to Augustine. Feminists have looked at that and said, you know, look, that's probably the sin of men, but not the sin of women. Sin of women could be self-denial, too much self-denial. Denial of self to the point of just not even having agency, if you know what I mean by that. Having a set of a self, a sense of self, um, a sense of worthiness. Um, um, but when I read that, I thought, my God, that describes me. Um, can that be possible? I always felt like a, an interloper, you know, on feminist literature, uh, that they were describing what they felt as women's experience of the sin of self-denigration to the point of self-hatred. And I, I, I was experiencing that myself. I felt like an interloper on somebody else's experience because that's exactly what I experience. Can this be true? I've hardly admitted it much. Uh, over the years, but I have said some about it. I, and there's no, so there's no scientific basis for it. That's why I was so attracted to Brene Brown because in her work on shame, she says it is a virtual universal in her research that we all experience shame, a sense of unworthiness, a sense of not being enough, profound insecurity, a profound sense that um, we need to be something more a fadedness about perfection and a fadedness to imperfection, etc. Now, to be, to be sure, we may act out on it in different ways, and we do. And I have done plenty of what has been stereotypically male in arrogance and pride and claiming uh, my, uh, more than my fair share of the airspace. I have done that. I played my part. But it comes out of a profound sense of insecurity, I can tell you that. And this is very much in sync with, 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 with what others are saying that I think is so absolutely profound. I, as, as many of you know have been hearing me preach over the last couple of years, I have been really taken with theologian Wendy Farley and her kind of redoing of also of Augustine's understanding of sin. She also acknowledges that Augustine got some of it right. He said that sin was pride. 
and disobedience. But she found something in Augustine that I had never seen before. That before, before the fall of Adam came the fall of the angels. And the angels fell because of a panic that they were not loved by God. Did you get that? The angel fell because of an existential panic that they were not loved by God. And so, according to Wendy Farley, the first fall, the core fall, b before arrogance, before disobedience, was, and don't be put off by the mythological language that Augustine uses. He's talking about existential stuff here. He's talking about stuff that goes inside, uh, inside of us almost every day of our lives. And that is the sense that we're not, not only not worthy, we're not, we're not worthy of love. And we're cut off from it. We're forever in exile. It is for this reason, I believe, that Augustine's famous prayer is so vital for all of us to understand and to acknowledge. The heart is restless, O oh God, until it rests in thee. It's a restlessness for worthiness. It's a restlessness for love. Do you see the connection? Insecurity. Um, shame because of lack of worth. A feeling of lack of worth. Um, being cut off from love. There's a straight line, I believe, between the two. And I believe there's a straight line between the God of the Bible and addressing that. Little known but true. The God of the Bible is, in my mind, has a cruciform trajectory, arc. Now, cruciformity, that seems to suggest it's focused on the New Testament and cross and resurrection. I want to suggest that cruciform is the pattern from the beginning to the end. The God of the Bible, after all, hears the cry of the slaves in Egypt, suffers with them. The God of the Bible, the God of the prophets, um, speaks to the exiles in Babylon, and the ambassador to the, God's ambassador to the exile is a suffering servant who suffers with the people. And Isaiah says about this suffering servant that a, that, that a bruised reed I will not break, a dimly burning wick I will not quench. And then we have, of course, the God of Jesus. Jesus, as um, the very revelation of God, had special concern for the outcast. Those who felt themselves outcast on society or those who were outcast socially. And then you get Paul, who makes an interesting statement about the cross. He says to the Corinthians, I claim to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified, which is foolishness to some and shameful to others. You see, for Paul, the cross was shameful in that Jesus was crucified outside the bounds of Judaism by Gentiles. That was almost by definition shameful in the ancient world. But that very shameful place became the wisdom of God incarnate. That very shameful place became the place where God was resurrecting love. It is in the vulnerable spots for Paul the places of our most vulnerable weaknesses, that God's love can grow, can heal, can mend, can empower us to act in love one for the other. And so let's fast forward to Ephesians. Again, probably not written by Paul, probably by a disciple of Paul, who was writing to a whole new generation of folk who are just like us. They live in a shame and honor world and feel themselves unworthy. And how does he begin he or she, we don't know, in fact, because Paul had women disciples. Says so in the book of Romans and elsewhere. Um, the letter begins with some extraordinary things. God has blessed us with the richness of blessing from the heavenly places and chosen us before the foundation of the world and adopted us to be God's own. These are the most honorific titles that could ever be bestowed on ancient people and they should be perceived among us as the most honorific titles. The kinds of stuff that we ought to see about ourselves as the core of who we are and what we're called to be and to do. That God is on a trajectory with every one of us at those broken spaces of our lives to bring healing and love and wholeness and a sense of worth when we feel 
unworthy. And then when we act out of our unworthiness in breaking others as we have been broken, God is a lo- God of love and forgiveness. And Paul and, and, and the author of Ephesians also says that. It's an amazing thing. The, um, the, the, uh, the, the gifts that are bestowed upon us in this passage. Um, the, uh, the gift of foreknowledge is one that I think is worth pointing out. The gift of foreknowledge. You know, you know so many people have taken that and talked about it as being one of the, uh, the places in the Bible talks about predestination. And I'm not going to go there. If you want to attend new members classes, everybody wants to talk about predestination in new members classes. We can do that in new members. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to say what the essence of it is. What the essence of it is. And that is, we are not an afterthought in God's eyes. We are not an afterthought. God had, in God's intention, that we would be children, that we would be richly blessed, that we would be most worthy, the most worthy of God's creation from the very beginning of time. And that was God's intent from the very beginning. It is God's intent now. So if you feel yourselves to be caught up in a chain of events that will never bring perfection, if you feel yourselves to be caught up in a sense of unworthiness and a fadedness about imperfection, if you feel yourself to be caught up in a woundedness because of who you are and what you've done, sins of omission, sins of a commission, then hear the words of Ephesians. Hear the word of God whose trajectory in the world is cruciform, who is always bringing life out of the broken places of your life, healing and forgiveness. Hear the word and be raised and have the blessings of God bestowed upon you. Be lifted up to heavenly places. That is is your um, right and privilege as being ones who are sealed by God's spirit, given that spirit, restored to your rightful place and given a work to do. That's where all of us are called. That's who we are as children of God. And that's who we are as church. We're called to be worthy when we feel the most unworthy. We're called to be forgiven when we feel the most broken and sinful. We're called to be children when we feel ourselves to be orphans. Thanks be to God, and let's get to work. Amen.